ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶದಯಾಪಾತ್ರಂ ಧೀಭಕ್ತಿಯಾದಿ ಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣಂ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯ ಜಾತರ ಮುನಿಂ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀನಾಥ ಸಂಭಾಂ ನಾಥಯಾಮುನ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕ ಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಶೈಲೇಶಾತ್ರಿ ಗುಣಾರ್ಣವಂ ಯತೀಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರವಣ ವಂದೇ ರಮ್ಯಜಾತರ ಮುನಿ ಯೋ ನಿತ್ಯಮಚ್ಯುತ ಪದಾಂಬುಜಯುಗ್ಮರುಗ್ಮ ವ್ಯಾಮೋಹತಸ್ತರಿತರಾಣಿ ತೃಣಾಯಮೇನೆ ಅಸ್ಮದ್ಗುರೋರ್ ಭಗವತೋಸ್ಯ ದೈಕ ಸಿಂಧೋ ರಾಮಾನುಜ ಚರಣೌ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೇ ಲೋಕಾಚಾರ್ಯಾ ಗುರವೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣಪಾದ ಸೂನವೇ ಸಂಸಾರ ಭೋಗಿ ಸಂದಷ್ಟ ಜೀವ ಜೀವಾತವೇ ನಮಃ ಅಪಗತ ಮದಮಾನೈರಂತಿಮೋಪಾಯ ನಿಷ್ಠೈ ಅಧಿಗತ ಪರಮಾರ್ಥೈರರ್ಥ ಕಾಮಾನಪೇಕ್ಷೈ ನಿಖಿಲಜನ ಸುಹೃದ್ಧಿರ್ನಿರ್ಜಿತ ಕ್ರೋಧ ಲೋಭೈ ವರವರ ಮುನಿಭೃತ್ಯೈರಸ್ತು ಮೇ ನಿತ್ಯ ಯೋಗ so today directly we will um, one minute directly we will come to the <coughs> beginning of the avatarika of manavala mamuni so whenever we start the study of a work we study it with a commentary it is known as ವ್ಯಾಖ್ಯಾನತೋ ವಿಷಯ ದಿ ಸ್ಪೆಷಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಕಾಮೆಂಟ್ರಿ ಇಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೈನ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನರ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವ್ಯಾಖ್ಯಾನತೋ ವಿಶೇಷ ಪ್ರತಿಪತ್ತಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಎನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡ್ ವ್ಯಾಖ್ಯಾನ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಎಸ್ ವಿಶೇಷ ವಿಶಿಷ್ಟ ಆಖ್ಯಾನ ವ್ಯಾಖ್ಯಾನ ಸೊ ದಿ ಎಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಪರ್ಪರ್ of the original text is best known only when a person is able to understand the intention of the speaker or intention of the author of the main work therefore we always take the help of the vyakhyana which is very loosely translated as a commentary because as far the, as far as the indian shastras are concerned different types of commentaries are involved for example we call certain types of commentaries as bhashyas in english we just say for example if it is the shri bhashya of ramanuja acharya so we call it it's a commentary on the brahma sutras then you have what is known as vritti granthas that is also called as a commentary and there are several other types of commentaries which are all generally known as commentaries only but there is lot of difference between these so vyakhyana is different bhashya is different vritti is different so different different types of commentaries are there in sanskrit language and also in the indian tradition so in this context as i have mentioned in the earlier classes we take the help and guidance of the commentary of swami manavala mamuni who is known as varavara muni in sanskrit <clears throat> to study the works of pille lokacharya and whenever we start the study of ever the commentators or the vyakhyanakaras start with what is known as avatarika avatarika or bhumika or pitika are the use or some of the words that are used in this context so what is the need for an avatarika why should there be an avatarika or pitika or bhumika <clears throat> before a work is actually started to be explained 
I will mention a few words about this and then directly go to the words, I mean, study the Avatarika or Bhumika of Pranavanabam. It once again, the word Bhumika or Pitika or Avatarika is translated as an introduction. Of course, Avatarika definitely gives an introduction, but the word Avatarika or Bhumika is having a lot of connotations which the word introduction does not give. So, when we talk, uh, talk about avatarika, it means it actually brings us to the level of, it brings the work to the, level, to the level where the target audience can understand it. So, for example, Prilaloka Acharya starts directly with the statement, Mumukshuvak Ariyavendam Rahasyam Moonru. He directly states that a Mumukshu or a person who is desirous of attaining salvation or liberation has to know these three Rahasyas or secret mantras. So, this is how Pridladoka Acharya starts the treatise. But one may question, suddenly why is he saying this? To whom is he saying this? Of course, he is starting with the word, with the word, word Mumukshu. But once again, what is the background? In what context is Pridaloka Acharya mentioning this work? Who is the target audience? Why one has to study? What is the main aim of objective of the study of this work, etc.? So Swami Manavala Mahavani, who is known as the Vyakhyana Chakravarti, gives a very beautiful account of in what context, in what context this work is being authored. So he says, Sri Aspatiyai, Sri Vaikuntanike Pananai, Nitya Bhukta Nubhavyanana, Niratishayananda Yuktanai, Irikira Sarveshwaran and Itya Suri Hadopadi Tanay Anupavitti Itya Kainkariya Kainkariya Saktarai Varhik Pratibanda Kama Irikira I am unable to see. Also, I will just tell about this. So, this is how all the all the Sampradaya Kantas in Sri Vaishnava philosophy start. So, it is it starts with the word Sri Aspatiyai, whether you take the Sri Vaishnava Bhushnam or Bhagavad Vishyam or any other commentary for that matter. All the works start with the word Sri Aspatiyai which describes the unique aspect of Bhagavan Sriman Narayana. So he is known as Sri Pati or the consort of Goddess Lakshmi. This has a lot of significance which I am not going to mention now because Pridladoka Acharya himself is going to uh, explain this in great detail. He is going to explain the word Shri in seven different seven or eight different manners. And then he goes on to mention that Sri Pati is Lord Narayana, who is our sum and substance, and also he is the greatest person, Supreme Lord, whom we all have to attain. So in this context, how Banavana Mamuni actually gives an avatarika or introduction to this Mumukshupati, he says, Shri Aspatiyai, Shri Kunta Niketananai, etc. First, he says, he talks about the unique aspect of Bhagavan Shri Narayana, which is actually.
sorry for the, the interruption so he says shef patiyai sri vaikuntani ke tananai nitya nukta anubhavanai and a few other <coughs> adjectives that that actually denote the supreme lord narayan so first he says shef patiyai second he says shri vaikuntha niketanai nitya mukta anubhaviyanai then nitya nirateshe ananda yuktanai so these are the four first first four adjectives mentioned by swami manavanam so first what happens he says who is the supreme lord narayan there has to be some idea about this in this context first thing to be known is he is yf pati he is the consort of lord goddess mahalakshmi so this i will not explain here because <clears throat> in the dwaya prakarana he is going to explain this in great detail he says shriman narayana charanam sharanam kutaji this is very very significant that he is going to explain or i will also explain in some other context because i don't want to go into that in great detail now because it will take nearly 2 to 3 hours to explain that so this is one of the unique aspects of shri vaishnava sampradaya that much will not for the time second thing is shri vaikuntha niketana nai he resides in the divine abode of vaikuntha so when you come to the philosophical part of vishishta advaita <coughs> we say that he possesses two vibhutis or two of his kingdoms to put it in a rather uh, mundane manner fifth dams also because he enjoys absolute supremacy over both these vibhutis that is nitya vibhuti and also veera vibhuti so nitya vibhuti is the <clears throat> are all the lokas or worlds that are beyond the veera which is actually this which actually covers the entire what do you call it uh, the solar system or several several galaxies etc as they are known in modern astronomy so very briefly i will explain this this we this earth is part of a solar system but when we see the overall solar system the earth is just a small speck and sun is the main component of this solar system and all the planets and sub planets are going around the sun in one way or the other but Once again, this solar system is only a small speck, and there are millions and trillions of galaxies. This solar system is part of one galaxy. There, like that, there are millions and trillions of galaxies. That's what astronomers tell us. <clears throat> so there might be so many galaxies in which several Earths might be there, and several people like us might be living. So trillions and trillions of people may be living in trillions and trillions of galaxies. so that is why it is mentioned as akila anda koti brahma anda ra so according to the traditional <coughs> way in which it is mentioned there is an anda kata then there are seven samudras etc that is mentioned in shrimad bhagavatam and several other traditional works like the puranas so that is one way of looking at the cosmos and we have the modern way of looking at the cosmos also which is in no way <coughs> uh, less than the, uh, less than that because we are made to understand that this is in this is totally huge huge mammoth large etc mammoth 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 thing this entire whatever uh, this uh, galaxy system or whatever you like to call it so he is the supreme lord of all these things but the purusha sukta mentions pado os yavishwa bhutani tripadas yamritam divi all these things that is unimaginable uncomprehensible and satrise on the one quarter of his entire vibhuti or aishwarya or his kingdom three fourths of this kingdom is beyond the beyond this it is in divi or in the sky so once again my acharya used to say it is beyond that means not in terms of physical 
in terms of physical also it is big but it is in terms of spiritual in the spiritual plane which nobody nobody can understand as of now unless he is blessed by the lord himself that is why it says vishwa bhutani asya pada the entire whatever this uh, this cosmos as we call it is only one quarter of his kingdom and tripadasya amritam so our ultimate aim is to reach vaikuntha where a jivatma attains unlimited bliss so that is why everywhere he is mentioned as sri vaikuntha niketana nai so his eternal divine abode is sri vaikuntha and the word vaikuntha also has lot of connotations which i'll not going to write and nitya mukta anubhavya nam sarvesh and there he is vaikunthe tu pare loke shtiya sardham jagatpati aste vishnu rachincha bhaktair bhagavatai sah he is eternally survived by served sar, by nityas and muktas nitya nitya muktas and muktas so once again all these sampradaya terms are filled with principles that are mentioned in the philosophy aspect or the siddhanta aspect so according to the vishishta advaita philosophy the jivatmas are individual souls are of three types that is baddhas muktas and nitya muktas baddha means all the souls like us who are in this world who are bonded by our karma and unable to enjoy the bliss or vision of the supreme lord so we are all known as baddhas or bonded jivatmas second is <coughs> muktas who have who were earlier bonded in this world in this samsara or cosmos but by the grace of the divine lord they have been liberated and they have been given a permanent place in the shri vaikuntha so they are known as muktas and then you have a third category of jivatmas who are called nitya muktas or nityas they are also called as nitya baddha mukta and nitya nitya refers to <coughs> nitya mukta actually nitya and nitya mukta both are synonyms so nitya muktas are those divine eternally divine beings like divine jivatmas or souls like ananta garuda vishwaksena etc so neither they have had any bonded earlier nor they have it now nor will they have it in future also so they have never had the samsara sambandha or they have not they have never undergone any bondage so they are divine beings so in the vaikuntha eternal abode in his eternal abode nar narayana he is always served by these muktas and nitya muktas muktas who have been under bondage earlier and have reached the divine abode by his grace and also those eternally divine beings who have never undergone bondage at any period of time so nitya mukta anubhavyanai and they are enjoying him enjoying his divine form divine leelas etc eternally once they go there as it is mentioned in the shri bhashya nacha punaravartate nacha punaravartate once a jivatma enters vaikuntha then there is no question of him returning back he will eternally continue to enjoy for and it is said for how many years for how many millions trillions no so it is said nakalas tatra vai prapti there the concept of time does not exist in vaikuntha it is beyond time and physical space it is beyond physical time and physical space so the time question of time does does not at all arise in that case but the supreme lord narayana thinks that even though he is enjoyed and served by millions and millions of jivatmas in the heaven in the in his uh, eternal abode that is shiva kuntha he always thinks about us the bonded jivatmas bonded souls <clears throat> because in the sampradaya granthas there is a very beautiful statement 
ದೇಶಾಂತರಗತನಾನ ಪುತ್ರನ್ ಪಕ್ಕಲಿದೆ ಪಿತೃಹೃದಯ ಕಿಡಕ್ಕುಮಾ ಪೋದೇ ಸೊ ಸಪೋಸ್ ಎ ಫಾದರ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಫೈವ್ ಸನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಫೋರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಮ್ ಆರ್ ಆಲ್ ವೆಲ್ ಟು ಡು ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮನಿ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎನ್ ಆಫ್ ವೆಲ್ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ವೈಫ್ ದೇ ದೇ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಇಸ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಫೈನ್ ಆಲ್ ದೋಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಫೈನ್ ಬಟ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ ಸನ್ is actually residing in some remote area of the world and not much is known about his whereabouts or how he is whether he is happy whether he is having good food to eat good place to live etc so even though there are four sons who are doing very well in all aspects the father will always be thinking about the son who is not with him and he always thinks oh what is that son doing is he happy or not what should i do to make him more happy etc etc similarly the supreme lord narayana though he is eternally happy he does not have any anything to be achieved that is why it is mentioned as he yaspatiya yavapta samasta kamana in another context in the beginning of bhagavad gita so <clears throat> he is actually though he is served eternally by all the nityas and muktatmas nitya muktatmas he actually craves for us that is the jeevatmas who are bonded and who are living in this world who are actually totally forgetful as far as their own atmas are concerned their own souls are concerned that is me. because most of us i would like to mention the first as myself how much how much time do we think about god or lord narayana in a day probably we might think about him for one second or a fraction of a second in the morning then the afternoon in the evening or sometime something like that especially if we are doing some some japa or chanting or whatever most of the times i would like to tell about me i or people like me will be thinking about our life uh, how much we are earning what we have to do for our life what is our job and what are the things involved in our jobs then our families then uh, if somebody is insulting us we feel bad if somebody is praising us we feel good and all those things but how much time do we think about god and god only how much time do we think about lord narayana and lord narayana only that is the first point second point is how to understand how to actually as of now we have not had the divine vision of the supreme lord like arjuna had of lord krishna when he gave the super the vishwarupa darshana or like the alvars like namalvar etc had where they could have the super bhagavad sakshatkara as it is known in english in sanskrit even in the tamil works we say ನೆಂಜೆನ್ನುಂ ಉಲ್ಕಣ್ಣೇಲ್ ಕಾಣು ಮುಣರ್ವೇ ಹೌ ಡು ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಡಸ್ ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ದಿ ವಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಲಾರ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ ನೆಂಜೆನ್ನುಂ ಉಲ್ಕಣ್ಣೇಲ್ ಕಾಣು ಮುಣರ್ವೇ ಅಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಸಾಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ ಡಸ್ ನ ಮಾಂಸ ಚಕ್ಷು ಅಭಿವೀಕ್ಷತೆ ತಂ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟರ್ನಲ್ ಲೈ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ದಿ ಮಾಂಸ ಚಕ್ಷುಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ fleshy eye if it is translated literally that fleshy eye can not perceive the supreme lord so only the inner eye that is the heart nenje means heart so nenjennum ulkannel kaanu munarvu so the vision of the sakshatkara of the supreme lord can be had in the heart which is the internal eye that is why everywhere it is mentioned yogi hrid jana gamyam so everywhere in sanskrit literature in the bhakti literature in the puranas itihasa etc he can be cognized in the hridaya or the heart which exists in the body so that is that is why he is called uh, called as dahara kasha and it is said that that dahara kasha is in, is in the heart 
So there might be several questions as to whether this refers to the physical heart, which pumps blood and supplies it all over the body. Or is it something beyond the physical heart? That's a very deep and important question. I'll not go into that. I'll, if somebody is really interested, I will try to explain. Even I am, I am not fully conversant with the answer, but I will try to explain what little I know, what little I have heard from my acharya. So nitya nitya mukta anubhavyanai niratishyaranda yuktanai. So he says, that Supreme Lord, he is, what is his greatness? That is the question. Niratishyaranda Yuktanai. He is a person who is always enjoying supreme bliss. What do you mean by supreme bliss? Niratishyaranda Yuktanai means what? The answer is unsurpassed bliss. Ananda is bliss <clears throat> which is in contrast with happiness. So bliss is also a type of happiness, but <clears throat> it's a highly evolved form of happiness. Because, for example, when we talk about happiness in general terms, we say happiness means Suppose a person might consume alcohol and says, I, am, I become, I am great, I have a high, or I am very happy when I consume alcohol. Some people might get, say, they become happy when they consume, uh, when they smoke. Some people might say, when they have some sensual <coughs> pleasures, they may say, I am most happy. Or some people might say, I, am, I become happy when I, earn, when I get my salary every month. Suppose I earn one million dollars every month, I feel happy. But <coughs> these happiness, happinesses, as we may call them, are known as sukha only in Sanskrit, which is in contrast with your ananda, which is quite different from sukha, which is a. Sorry for the interruption. <clears throat> so that is known as Ananda in Sanskrit, which is not to do with the worldly pleasure, but what we call as pleasure that belongs to the other world or which is beyond the physical thing. And we have a very beautiful analogy which is given in the Second Prashna of Taitri Upanishad, known as the Brahmananda Vani. So here, the, an attempt is made by the Upanishad itself, by the Vedic literature itself. And when we personify Vedic literature, we call him as Veda Purusha. So the Veda Purusha himself make an, makes an attempt to quantify the Ananda of Brahma, or the Supreme Lord Narayana. Why I am mentioning this is, he says, Niratishayananda Yuktana, it is very important. Because later, when we say that he is Nitya Mukta Anubhavyana, it means that the same bliss that is enjoyed by the Supreme Lord is enjoyed by the Nitya, Nitya Mukta Atmas also. So, what is this? Suppose a person asks in purely business terms, if a, if a Jivatma asks, what will I get if I chant properly these three mantras, the Mokshupadi, which explains the three mantras? What will I get if I chant the Dray Mantra, Tri Mantra, and Dray Mantra and Termashtra? So the answer is Nitya Mukta, Nubhav, Yanai. And who are the Nitya Muktas? They are possessing the same amount of bliss or ananda that is enjoyed by the Supreme Lord Narayana. Then what is the bliss? How much is it? If the question is asked, the question, the answer is given by the 
<clears throat> what is known as the Brahmananda Valley or the chapter on Brahmananda that is found in the Taittiri Upanishad. So there, I have actually prepared the slides for that also. I will show it in the next uh, class. <clears throat> so very briefly, I will explain it and then proceed because I don't want to get held up in these aspects itself. Of course, these are also very important as far as the Sampradaya Bhaga and Siddhanta Bhaga are concerned. But we will go directly to the text. I want to go to the text as, uh, as early as possible. So he says, first, <clears throat> the Upanishad or the Veda Purusha explains one unit of Anand. So he says, Saishanandasyami magam sa bhavati yuva asyad sa duyuva jayakaha ashishto dridhishto barishta tasyayam prativi sarva vittasya purna asyad saeko manusha anandaha. So first he defines the one, the unit of one manusha ananda, human ananda. What is it? If at all it, it can happen, of course it can never happen. As far as this Manusha Ananda is concerned in this world, assuming that, we say in, in English, assuming that, hypothetically we say in that manner. So, Yuva Asyad Sadhu Yuva Dhyayakaha, he should be in the prime of his youth. Probably at the age of 28 or 30, we say he is in the prime of his youth. Then, Ashishtaha, Dridishtaha, Balishtaha. He should be strong mentally. He should be very much strong physically. Then, Ashishtaha, Dridishtaha. Ashishtaha is, he should be able to consume any amount of food, etc. without affecting his health. So, for example, if I consume uh, some uh, milk poison, which is very mm -hmm. nicely done in Kshetras or the Divya Deshas like Melkot or Tirnarayan from where I am, from where I am talking right now. So, suppose a person has diabetes and he consumes two uh, cups full of milk poison. So immediately his sugar levels will shoot up and tomorrow he has to take more insulin or he has to face the consequences. Or suppose I take what is known as puliyogari, which is a flagship uh, dish prepared in the Sri Vaishnava households, especially in uh, Melkote and other places. So suddenly the spices may affect my digestive system. Then such a person is not Ashish. So he should be able to consume any amount of food without affecting his health. And he should be very strong physically, he should be very strong mentally, he should be what is known as Sastha, according to Ayurveda. There is one very important concept. So Ayurveda, in Ayurveda, the concept of wellness is extremely well defined. I'll just mention it as a passing remark and then proceed. It says, Samadoshaha, Samadhishtya, Samadhatu, Malakriya, Prasanna, Atma, Indriya, Manaha, Swasthai, Pradhiya. This has to be explained in great detail because it is actually very important that we know it, even from the Sri Vaishnava point of view, because all the Anhikas are very closely associated with Ayurvedic wellness, the concept of wellness explained in Ayurveda. So, Samadoshaha, Samadhishtya, his Humors, which is known as the Vata, Pitta and Kapha. These three are the humors that <clears throat> make the human body. When they are in equilibrium, it means a person is in good health. And if a person, when these are vitiated, the equilibrium is disturbed, then what happens? <clears throat> his health is bad. So, Samadoshaha, Samad, Mishta. And his digestive height should be good. Samadhatu Malakriya. His excretion should be proper. His all the other uh, functions of the body should be good. They should be at the optimum level. And then very importantly, Prasanna Atma Indriya Mana. All his sense organs should be working at the best 
in the best possible way then his mind intellect and atma are the soul all these three should be in very good shape such a person is known as swastha so in this context when we, when the upanishad describes a manusha and it says he should be at of the optimum health which is covered by this ayurveda statement which i mentioned just now. and then yuvasya sadhu yuvad jayaka ashishto drishto parishto tasye yam prithivi sarva vitrasya purnasya all the prasna wealth of the earth should belong to him is it possible it's definitely not possible but assuming that it's possible hypothetically suppose you say bill bill gates is worth some several trillion dollars and you say warren buffet is worth several trillion dollars then you have mark zuckerberg who is the uh, founder of facebook he is worth several billion dollars or apple they have cash reserves of several trillion dollars but does any one person own the entire wealth of the world no it's not possible but assuming that he owns it and he is physically well mentally well he is having the optimum level of health etc assuming and he is in his prime of his youth assuming that all these can happen that is known as one manusha ananda or one human bliss and then it goes on explaining this so 100 times manusha ananda is this 100 times of that say eko deva gandharva manushya gandharva anamananda te eshta manushya gandharva anamananda say eko deva gandharva anamananda te eshta deva gandharva anamananda say eko pitrnam trilok loka anamananda te eshta pitrnam trilok loka anamananda say eko deva anamananda so tending to this is who those atmas are those souls who have reached the stage of manushya gandharvas then this into 100 multiplied by 100 is the bliss of deva gandharvas then this into 10 100 uh, 100 times multiplied by this is pitri the ananda of the pitris who are once again under the class of jivatmas then that into 100 is devas like this he goes on multiplying 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 then 100 100 times deva so the ajaraja deva karma deva etc huge explanation very wonderful explanation exhaustive explanation about how many classes of jivatmas are there but all these are under bondage so you have ajaraja deva karma deva there is no much explanation on the small small explanations about these classes of souls are available so who are the ajanaja devas who are the karma devas we are not very familiar today then we come to the devas of the demigods then 100 times that is the bliss of indra and 100 times that is brihaspati and 100 times that of brihaspati is brahman etc so it is said if a person puts the numeral 1 and 17 zeros so you can calculate how many trillions it is going to be so many trillions trillion times so the one unit of human bliss or manusha ananda multiplied into so many trillion times is one brahma ananda so many trillion times don't note it is just to be noted so here what happens is <clears throat> ब्रह्मानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक्तनाषयानंदुक
So ultimately, suppose a very rich person is there and he purchases a private yacht which is worth several billions of dollars or he has a private uh, aircraft like Air Force One or something like that which is equipped with all the facilities. Will he feel happy when he, if he enjoys it alone or will he feel happy or will he enjoy that enjoyment when he enjoys it along with his family members or close persons? Definitely he will enjoy it only when the enjoyment is shared with his close, with people who he deems are close to him. It might be his wife, his children or his close friends etc. etc. So here also it says in the Brahmananda Valley, so Oshnute Sarvan Kama Saha Brahmana Vipashtite Even the liberated soul will actually enjoy all the pleasures, all the bliss of the Brahman along with the Brahman. That is why it is in the Siddhanta, it is known as Bhotra Bhogya Sahitya. So the <clears throat> togetherness of the Bhogya and Bhogtri, that is Bhogtri and Bhogya, that is the Jivatma and Paramatma. Together they enjoy all these. So he says, these are the, this is how the Supreme Lord is. And what does he want to do? Although he has attained all the things that need to be attained in the sense, one should not feel that Earlier he had not attained it and later he attained it by performing some means. It's not like that. He is always Nitya Tripta. That means there is nothing he has not attained. He had not attained earlier. There is nothing he has not attained now. And nothing he has not attained. He is going to attain in the future. He is going. There is unattainable in the future also because always he is full. So such a Supreme Lord, what does he do? He wants all the Jeevatmas to actually <coughs> attain him, attain himself. That is, he wants all the Jeevatmas to come near him, become like him, and enjoy the bliss he is, a, he is enjoying. In Sanskrit, in the Shastras, there is a saying, Ekaha Swadu Napunji. So suppose a wonderful dish is performed in the row in the form of prasadam is prepared and offered to the Lord. So the person who has prepared it should not consume it first. Especially if it is very tasty, then he has to share it with his fellow beings. So this is not only mentioned in the context of Sri Vaishnavas. It is mentioned in the context of general human values as well. So the Manusmriti, which is widely acclaimed by all our Purvacharyas, actually mentions that if a very tasty dish is prepared, if a very delicious dish is prepared, first share it with your fellow beings. And especially if it's a Shiva Ishtama, then he has to First offer it to all the fellow Shri Vaishnavas and then partake it. First he has to offer it to God. Of course, God will not physically consume it. As, as, as soon as he has realized, like in the story of several great Bhagavatas or divine uh, personalities, after they can realize whether the Supreme Lord has partaken it or not, though he physically does not partake it. And there are several great miraculous stories where, where it is mentioned that the God physically also part of the prasadam or the offering that was made to him. That's a different issue. So then he has to offer it with, to his fellow Shri Vaishnavas who are senior to him. Of course, a real Shri Vaishnava feels that all fellow Shri Vaishnavas are much more senior to him in all respects. So he has to offer it to all of them. And then, as the shesha, or as the leftover, then he has to partake it. That is how. That is what the Shri Vishnu Dharma says. That is what is the duty of a Shri Vishnu. Similarly, even the Supreme Lord, 
he has to first follow the principle before he has he asks us to do so so what does he do he says nitya mukta anubhavyanai irikya sarveshwaran and the nitya suri halopadi tannai anubhavitte nitya kaikarya So he wants to do that. So he wants all the fellowship, all his children, that is us, to also enjoy the same bliss which the Nitya Mukta is enjoying by serving him. So what did he do? He actually gave us several opportunities. So the first thing he did was he gave us this body and the indriyas. That is the sense organs. Even though we are given the sense organs and we are given the body, most of us, that is 99.9999% of us, like what we are today, like all of us are today, or like persons like me. All of us are engaged in other type of activities. Of course, a person has to earn a living to actually sustain this body. But 99.9% .9 of our efforts are taken away in sustaining this body and also supporting this body and the associated activities where we don't have any time to think about what spirituality or the Sri Vaishnava uh, spiritual path is all about, or even about the Supreme Lord, whom attaining whom is our main priority, should have been our main priority in life. So, for that purpose, the easiest way is what is known as the Bhakti Marga or the Prakriti Marga. And as an Anga of that, as part of that, the Supreme Lord Narayana himself actually gave to all of us, that is the Jivatmas, these three Rahasya Mantras or the Secretive Mantras, that is the Dvaya Mantra. <coughs> then for the first, that is the Thiru Mantra or the Mantra Raja or the Ashtachira Maha Mantra. Then the Dvaya Mantra and then the Thirumashtra. So that is what Manavana Mahamani is going to explain here after. This is how the traditional uh, way of giving the introduction to Mokshupadi exists. As far as the, as far as a very mundane analogy can be given to this, we see a similar story in the Guru Parampara Prabhava, wherein the story of Periyarvar or Vishnu Chitta one of the premier most hard words is mentioned in a very beautiful manner. I will narrate this and conclude today's talk today. Today, I will conclude today's talk. Because all of us can very easily understand and relate. It, of course, we could understand and relate to the traditional way of introducing this also. But this is more appealing to us because it gives some very mundane examples. So once the king of the Pandya region of Tamil Nadu, as it was known then, in today's Tamil Nadu, even today we can identify which are the areas that were, that were ruled by a lineage called Pandyas. So the king of the Pandyas used to disguise himself. Of course, in all in those days, in the that is prehistoric and historical period of India. <clears throat> we understand, we come across several stories where the king used to disguise himself as a commoner and roam around the country to himself know how people, how his subjects are living, what are their problems and how to solve them also. So once the Pandya king who was known as Vallabhadeva, he disguised himself and he was roaming around the city of Madurai, which is there in Tamil Nadu. And in one place, 
in front of the in front of a house there used to be a platform like uh, structure in front of the house where people used to sit and chat and that was there until the last 50 years that is how houses are being constructed in all the traditional villages and also cities so in the city of madurai as he was disguised and going around in one of the places in, in front of a house on a platform on a platform like structure a few profound scholars were discussing some concept about philosophy so the king approached the senior scholar who was <clears throat> present there and he prostrated before him and said oh swami ji oh swami i am a commoner i request you to kindly give me something which i can think about which is give me some food for thought regarding what is the aim of life then the senior most scholar who was there he immediately recalled a verse from the mahabharata which says ವರ್ಷಾರ್ಥಮಷ್ಟೌ ಪ್ರಯತೆ ತಮಾಸಾನ್ ನಿಶಾರ್ಥಮರ್ಧನ್ ದಿವಸಮ್ಯತೆ ವಾರ್ಧಕ್ಯ ಹೇತೋರ್ ವಯಸ ನವೇನ ಪರತ್ರ ಹೇತೋರ್ ಇಹ ಜನ್ಮನ ವೆರಿ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲಿ ಈ ರಿಲೇಟ್ಸ್ ಹೌ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಟು ಅಸ್ಪೈರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅಟೈನಿಂಗ್ ಮೋಕ್ಷ ಆರ್ ಸರ್ವೇಶನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಈಸ್ ಅಟೈನಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಅಬೌಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ narayan in the divaikunta so he says varshartham ashtav prayate mas so if a <coughs> farmer who produces the basic grains that are required for our sustaining our life that is our staple food he has to rest during the rainy season then he has to put in great efforts and tirelessly <clears throat> do farming for about 8 months and then he can rest peacefully for 3 or 4 months of the year and varshartham ashtau prayate tamasan nishartham ardham divasam yate if a person has to sleep without any worries in the night he has to actually work during day time if he works hard during day time and earns enough food and has a place to stay then he can happily and peacefully have a good night sleep and today if we take the american concept of life if you have to enjoy your weekend then you have to struggle hard for the five days so if you struggle hard and save some money you can enjoy the weekends similarly if a person has to live peacefully without any worries when he is when he becomes old then he has to work and save some money when he is strong enough that is during youthhood he has to work without having any hesitation and also without any laziness and save some money so that he can live happily when he is old so just like we have these three very important examples if a person has to actually live happily after he leaves this body then he has to do something while he possesses this body paratra he to iha janmana so one cannot attain salvation with this body and every human being or every being every living being for this matter has to leave the body on one day or the other so after that if he has to be happy he has to do something while he is possessing this body so what is that so that is what is known as bhakti or devotion unto god 
and that bhakti yoga is signified that so bhakta saral we are all called as sheshas bhagavat sheshatvam sheshatvam swarupam is the main swarupa or the main unique defining feature of a shri vaishnava is he is called as bhagavat shesha bhuta he is totally controlled by the god he has to become the instrument of the god and it is said na akinchit kuruvataha shesha so suppose i call myself a shesha what do i do what should i do the shastra say if he is just having uh, having food and having good night sleep and other things then he will not be called as a shesha even though in mentally he might have that thing so it is said na akinchit kuruvataha shesha he is totally without and devoid of any activity then he cannot be called shesha that is why he has to engage in some activity or the other that will beget him the love and affection and the grace of the supreme lord so for that he has to do something that might be in the form of aradhana and for aradhana also that is the daily puja ritual as explained in the nitya grantha by manwal mamuni by swami ramanuja acharya etc and all aspects of the tiruva aradhana is involves these three that is brahma mantra tirama shloka and also the ashtakshara maha so suppose you have to do the abhimantrana of the divine water that is to be offered offered so says it says shodha mula mantra na abhimantriya so to make it fit for offering to the lord you have to chant the six mula uh, mantra or tirama mantra six times and when we say arkhim samarpayami padyam samarpayami atmi samarpayami and all this we have to use the dwaya mantra om namo narayana ya arkhim samarpayami om namo narayana ya padyam samarpayami etc it is mentioned in yamika and tiruvara mantras so that way also from a very 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 mundane point of view also this mumukshu padi which deals with the three mantras so you Tiruvam Mantra, Dwaya Mantra, and Charma Shloka is extremely significant, and that is what we are going to know about in the subsequent classes. So, with these words, I conclude today's talk. If you have any questions or any observations, any interaction, you are most welcome. Swami, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, you were explaining from Brahmananda Valley of Taittiriya Upanishad. about uh different forms of ananda different levels of ananda yes so there are there are some other schools i'm thinking of dwaitavad that uh, believes in taratamya that even in moksha there is a gradation of ananda whereas yes, yes. in shri vaishnav sampradaya everyone has got the ultimate ananda can you say yes. why can you say simply why taratamya is not accepted in ananda so it's a very <clears throat> long topic so i will try to put it in a nutshell <clears throat> there is a nyaya or a axiom or a maxim rather which says which is known as tatkratu nyaya in sanskrit yatha kratuh asmin loke purusho bhavati tatha itah kre so <clears throat> it is to put it in very mundane terms i would like to say so now you have a company a software company let us say because <laughs> here all so much i'm here with these terms i am explaining in these terms i hope you will not mind so suppose there is a software engineer who puts in 12 hours of work a day and there is a similar software engineer who has the same educational qualification but he puts in only 6 hours of work a day so a person qualitatively and quantitatively the same so the person who is one person is designated as software engineer who does qualitatively and quantitatively more work whereas another person who is also designated as a software engineer does much 
there is much less work qualitatively and quantitatively. So what does the boss do? Automatically, he will pay the person who is doing more work quality-wise and quantity-wise. And the person who is doing lesser amount of work will be paid less. Is it not? Uh, you can interact in the middle, no problem. Do you yes. agree or not? Sure. <clears throat> so, as far as in the Indian government parlance, we say <clears throat> equal work for equal pay for equal work. So, if it is more work, you pay more. If it is less work, you pay less. Otherwise, if you are paying all the people the same uh, amount of wages, it will uh, it will be it will result in the communist philosophy, which nobody accepts or uh, which has been outdated and proven wrong. So similarly, the Tatkratu Nyaya says, "Yatha kratuhu asmin loke purusho bhavati." Suppose a person, I will give another example. Suppose a person chants the um, Hare Krishna mantra for thousand times a day for forty years. So he has chanted the mantra 40,000 times. Or uh, no, several, so, so many, 40, 40 years into 1,000. So you may calculate. Another person has done that for 60 years. So do you see, do, does the Lord give the same result to both of these? Is this correct? Is it correct or not incorrect? What do you say? I don't know. So, <laughs> in in no, in, in Kali Santran Upanishad, there's a there's a statement that uh, it should be chanted 35 million times. Okay, uh, for the time being, uh, let us not consider it. Suppose I say one person has done for two, one million times, and another person has two million done two million times. So the Lord, who is the bestower of the fruits of the uh, mantra Japa, does he give the same amount of fruit to this person as well as that? Common sensically, I am asking. Common sense says he doesn't give. He, he gives more to the person who chants more. Yes. <laughs> so that is Tatkratun Nyaya, which is explained in the Upanishads. So Madhvacharya says that According to the sadhana anushtana, as it is known, as so even in bhakti yoga, one person may do it to the 80th degree, assuming that there is something like that. One person may do it to the 60th degree, and another person may do it to the 40th degree. But uh, when a person performs bhakti yoga per se, he has to be granted liberation. Then, if I say all the three people are given the same amount of bliss, then what is the difference between this devotee and that devotee? Will I not be actually uh, what, uh, being partial to the person who has, suppose uh, in India we have this problem, where suppose there are 10 students who are very intelligent and they, uh, they actually gain 90% of marks. And then another person, is not so intelligent. So that is what is happening in India today widely. All, all over India it is happening. So he, since he is not able, he is uh, lazy or he is not uh, intelligent enough, he gets 30% uh, of marks. But he is given grace marks and upgraded to the person, level of persons who have got 90%. Is it correct? Will we agree? I will not agree. Or anybody will not agree for that matter. So, Badhvacharya says there is Taratamya in Moksha also because it depends on the sadhana or the amount of efforts he has put in when he is under bondage. This is perfectly logical and acceptable as far as we are concerned in this state. But what does the Shri Vaishnava philosophy say? Shiva Ishtama philosophy ultimately says, Bhagavan eva upayaha, Bhagavan eva upayaha. That is why 
these are all very very deep concepts of shri vaishnavism since they are highly evolved and you are able to comprehend i am mentioning this this is it is mentioned siddho upaya and sabjo upaya in the being there are two types of upayas there are there are two types of means one is siddho upaya and another is sabjo upaya siddho upaya is the means that is already readily available <clears throat> second is sabjo upaya the means that are to be attained here after even to attain the means you have to put in some efforts so that is another very important issue which we will deal later even if you have to start bhakti yoga you have to put in lot of efforts even if you have to start jnana yoga it is not like just the bhakti yoga is not so easy so and this is explained what is the exact nature of bhakti yoga what is the exact nature of jnana yoga what is the exact nature of karma yoga this is very beautifully succinctly mentioned in the gita artha sangraha of yamunacharya which nobody else has done and acharya ramanuja actually gives the gita bhashya the basis of the uh, gita artha sangraha itself i don't know whether it has been done by shila prabhupada or anybody have they explained in very succinct terms probably in one or two sentences the nature of karma yoga jnana yoga and bhakti yoga but it has been done by that doesn't mean to belittle anybody or anybody we accept accept and respect all the devotees so <clears throat> what is known as is vijnana yoga bhakti yoga etc sadhyo payas whereas the supreme lord himself is known as siddho paya so sharanagati or prapatti or surrender He is unto the supreme lord because to say that tame va upaya bhuto me bhava iti prarthana mati hi sharanagati what is the essence of sharanagati what is the unique feature of surrender it is very beautifully explained in this statement tame va upaya bhuto me bhava iti sharana iti prarthana mati hi so i cannot do jnana yoga i cannot do karma yoga i cannot do bhakti yoga so what do i do i say you are the means you alone are the means and you only are the means sameva upaya bhuto me bhava iti prarthana mati sharanagati you do this and offer everything that is yours to me so what is the upaya according to shri vishnu philosophy this is all not mentioned in madhva philosophy i'm sure because <clears throat> of course they are also <clears throat> mentioned as bhakti only as the moksha sadhana but <clears throat> that is at a comparatively lower level so uh, once again i say it's not belittle uh, to belittle anybody shri vishnu philosophy has evolved to the maximum possible extent you can see in these aspects not subjectively but objectively so what happens here is that as sharanagati as prapatti as it is mentioned in the dray mantra and also in all the three mantras it is you have the supreme lord only as the upaya which is the siddho upaya these terms are not available in any other vaishnava philosophy also you may verify for me so then ultimately which is the upaya for us, for all of us it is the supreme lord himself so is there any difference between a minor lord major lord etc in narayana is there is it there i am asking you a question yes no there they cannot okay. be so even if you apply the tatkratu nyaya which was applied in other cases since the supreme lord himself is the upaya he is the means so sadhana anugunam phalam so the fruit or the result is also according to sadhana so there is since the supreme lord himself is the upaya the upaya that is moksha also is common to everybody since the supreme lord is common to everybody so upaya is equal to everybody so upaya also the result also even if you apply tatkratunya there cannot be anandatarakam that is the 
स्टैंड अपि श्री वैष्णव अभिनस श्री वैष्णव संप्रदाय विशिष्टाद्वैत अभिनस इज द आंसर क्लियर and yes the answer is very clear that's a very simple uh, way of putting it um the only other the only other thing that i had to ask about and i don't want to take too much of your time is that uh, you mentioned that, that during this lifetime while we have this body we have to do something to uh, we have to act so that uh, after we don't have a body uh, we will attain something or we will attain moksha but there are there is there are other schools of philosophy like advaita that they say that uh, even within this body we can attain moksha we can have jivan mukti and why shri vaishnavism only accepts videha mukti and not jivan mukti so ramanuja acharya very beautifully states jivan mukti the term jivan mukti is mutually contradictory very important question but very important answer also so here the advaitins are may i mentioning the term i call it a term rather than a word because it's a technical term <clears throat> so you are having two words jivan mukti it's a mutually contradictory term suppose i say he is a truthful liar or a liar truth uh, something like that if a person is truthful he cannot be a liar or if he is uh, he is lying he cannot be speaking the truth he is speaking a truth by if you say what do you what do you mean suppose i say he is he speaking the truth no he is speaking a truth uh, a truth lie or lie truth or something like that because what is the meaning of the word jivan you analyze it from the point of view of language only not let us not going to philosophy at all so the word jivan means jiva prana dharane the word jivan is derived from the root jiva which means prana dharane that means he is possessing the prana in this body so suppose a person is dead what do you say in, in in india we gradually we very <clears throat> normally very commonly say he pranam poch that means he has lost his prana that means he is dead so if you say prana irka illa prana ha asti va nu prana idiya pran he ya nahi in every indian language whether it is north indian south indian telugu tamil kannada malayalam this type of <clears throat> usage is there does the prana exist or not to denote whether a person is living or not <coughs> so that means if a person is living that means he is possessing this body that means he is not finished his karmas so a person will live in his body until the effect of karmas are there can you call a person mukta or liberated when he still possesses the relation karma sambandha as it is known when he is given the association of karmas can you call a person liberated when he is still associated with karmas what is the answer no obviously not so how can the term jivan mukti be used but ramanuja acharya says and my guru used to very beautifully explain it you should not there can be a state of existence like those of namalvar and others where they possessed the body but did not have any karma sambandha so the state that is denoted by the term jivan mukti can be accepted but the term jivan mukti cannot be accepted even in our shri vaishnava philosophy such a state can they are they mention it in a different context in a different uh, sense whereas we mention it in we don't mention that state we don't mention that term 
but we mention we accept that state which is which can be denoted denoting the state of existence of greatest greatest realized souls like swami namarnath who had never who never had any karma sambandh <clears throat> so he lived here purely due to the wish of god for about 32 years and he never had any carnal cravings even basic cravings like food hunger etc so do you call him a bandit so we don't call him a bandit so but at the same time we don't call, call him a jeevan mukta also because that term is it's a mutually contradictory term but we accept it because he has he had transcended all the bodily cravings all karmas and he was eternally engaged in the supreme experience of the supreme law therefore we can accept and even my father used to explain, he explains it that there is a state that can be denoted by that term but we don't use that term because it's a mutually contradictory term but the advaitins refer to it in a different way that is not tenable because the main principle of advaita itself is not tenable which is explained in many treatises by ramanuja acharya and others if you say there is only one atman then where is the question of bondage and if suppose i am liberated everybody else has to be liberated so they say the jivatma itself is not there then they say param brahmaiva agnyam brahma parigatam samsara they say the brahman itself by means of avidya it takes the forms of jivas etc etc which is totally unappealing and illogical also and uh, it doesn't even make sense common from the point of view of common sense so that i'll not going to write so i hope i have answered your question yes so uh, so basically we can say that uh, if a person is buddha if there's a buddha yes he he is in he has got his karmas and he's in his body and he cannot he cannot want, stay within his body and and attain moksha at the same time but a yes. person a person like namalwar yes. was a, was already a mukta he's already a yes. mukta so yes. if if somebody is already a mukta and he takes an avatar uh, comes from uh, shri vaikuntham or or he, or even comes from somewhere else but if he is already mukta so the process of becoming a mukta cannot happen while we have the material body from bodhi yes. to mukta yes. but if we if he is already a mukta if he is a nichasuri or if he is a alwar or an acharya or someone who is already mukta then it's then it's okay yes but actually here once again we have to make a small uh, differentiation between namalwar and others because even our other acharyas we don't equate them to namalwar because they were having they were historical persons who used to have food and also other uh, human uh, things that are associated with food and things like that but only uh, namalwar was a person who never consumed food so he did not have other human things like we have like uh, uh, i don't uh, like to mention that word urination etc so that type of a person is totally probably only we can talk about namalwar only and not anybody else in that uh, at that level no other person existed at level for that for that matter because other acharyas they also had uh, food and other things like us but namalwar was the only person who did not have because he did not consume milk as a child as a new newborn and he did not have consume any food etc and since he did not consume food he did not have the issue of excretion etc so such a divine being only can be called as jeevan mukta kadi that doesn't mean that the other acharyas are <laughs> to belittle we can say namalwar was the highest that is how we would like to i would like to put it the, i mean there are some other miraculous things about uh, for instance mudalalwars were ayonages so yes, this is also very course. miraculous yes 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 they were not born of uh, of a of a mother yes yes that is what uh, because uh, one person one alwar was born in a bower of uh, flower bower or something like that so that's what uh, very very difficult to physically understand 
Yes, of course, you're absolutely right. But we have specific information about Namalwar having uh, not consumed food, etc. Whereas with regard to Mudalalwars, except for their uh, meeting in that uh, the, the place of Tirupavadur, etc., we don't have any information about their lives, uh, who, how how much time they lived, where they lived, etc. So uh, that is why I did not mention about them. So I think if any, I asked if anyone else has any questions or comments, otherwise we don't want to keep you up too late. No, no, no problem. Questions, I'd be very happy to answer this. Uh, perhaps I can ask something else just right now. Um, you were mentioning technically that uh, the, the system of the system of Varadhanam, according to Manavalama Munigal, which I believe is uh, called Jirpadi Tiruvaradhanam, um this this system involves the use of tira mantra uh dwaya mantra and charamasloka all all of them in the system of uh of tira so it, it, uh, i don't I, I don't have a copy of i have a copy of jirpadi tira but i'm it, it's in tamil Lippi and i have to transliterate it but i'm not sure uh, i haven't seen this system exactly. Um, it would be nice to have uh, an explanation of that because uh, yes. most most of us are following very simple Tiruvaradhanam in, in mostly in Sanskrit. Yes, definitely. I will, uh, I will uh, explain about that and also share a copy and perhaps literate some important portions of it. I also came to understand that there are perhaps uh, five or six commentaries um, on Mamukshapadi or on Mamukshapadi or, or on Manavala Mamuni's commentary on Mamukshapadi. There may be some sub commentaries by different people like PB and Angacharya and different people. Yep. Uh, yeah. are, are you, are you consulting all these different commentaries when you, when you, when you give Kalak Shepam or, or you just, uh, uh, no, sometimes I consult, of course, uh, <clears throat> if we consent, that will take about several years to cover. So I will. I am thinking of mentioning only the important uh, points that are there, uh, so that it will be beneficial to all the listeners. But uh, to cover all those things, it will take a lot of time. So I am uh, prioritizing them to, the, to whatever flashes to my mind. I don't know whether I am doing it right here or not, but. Whatever I feel is very important that I should let you people know I am doing it. Of course, you yourself are uh, good experts in so many aspects. And I hope uh, you are actually uh, having some use of the uh, explanations that I am giving. Definitely. Well, thank you very much. I don't, uh, I don't know that there are any other questions or comments about today's session. Thank you very much for taking the... It, I, it was probably difficult to, to do from Melkote without your uh, equipment. So. No, the lights are in the desktop system. So I, I, I thought I'll be going back to Mysore today. So I didn't bring, uh, bring it either. I could not get it by email or something. So I have not used these slides. Actually, I have summarized what I told today in slides also. So the traditional explanation given by Manwal Mamani. And also, this, the other explanation I gave also is from the Guru Parampara Prabhava Mundi, which is very much in line in tradition only. But uh, I felt that we could relate it more easily to that uh, the uh, uh, explanation given in Guru Parampara Prabhava. That's why I mentioned it here today. So I think uh, nobody else has any questions or comments. So thank you very much, Swami. We will we'll complete with the Mangala Shishaile Shadaya Patram Dipatya di Gunar Navam Pitindra Pravanam Vandiram Yajamataram Munim